Hi everyone, welcome back to Unlightened Turtle. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at a review. Well, I'm going to be doing a review on Know Your Ally, Great Britain. Now, as you, as you can tell, it's on pause. It's a bit of an older one. Um, should be interesting to see post-war, the lay of the land. Um, and yeah, compared to, to modern times, because obviously, you know, friendship post-war became a big thing before it rolled into the Cold War and things like this. Loads of secret services, CIAs, MI5s, all these intelligence apparatuses were set up. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how this this, uh, this unfolds. So let's get right into it. touchdown it was won by a team and every man on the team had a share in winning it i love that shout because i play team sports myself um, i'm not i'm not a big fan of rugby i have to be honest um, rugby of course is like american football except without the all the padding and the helmets etc but um yeah you're only ever as strong as your weakest link that's something that's always stuck with me in sport so if there was someone on your team that was weaker than you, you know, it's not helpful really to to be aggressive towards them, to get nasty with them. The best thing you can do is try and build them up, you know, try and elevate them to your level. We're playing another kind of a game now, only this one isn't for fun. It's for keeps. This game won't be won by any single player either. It'll be won by a team. A team called the United Nations. The ball will be carried by the men in the backfield. A tough little guy from China, Big Joe Russia, John Britton, and a guy called Yank. Big Joe Russia. Sorry, what was that? I've got to go back on that. team called the United Nations. The ball will be carried by the men in the backfield. The tough little guy from China. The tough little guy from China. Big Joe Russia. Big Joe Russia. It's lost on me that one. John Britton. And John Britton. What's with the JJ? I don't get that. And I thought Britain was like the soldiers in Britain were called Toms. Like a Tommy. So wouldn't it be like Tom Britton? I, I don't know. And a guy called Yank, the four greatest banks in the world. So let's take a look at the men who carry the ball with us. So can I just say, you know, as someone who's from Britain, it amazes me still that's only 60 years ago, 80 years ago, whether like Great Britain is such a small place and you're talking about Russia, United States and China, three of the largest land masses in the world, like per capita for a nation. Not the, but some of the biggest. And then you compare them to, to Great Britain. So tiny. Who are they? How do they live? What makes them tick? Let's start with the one that's toughest to understand. The one we know just enough about to confuse us. John Britton. Here's where he lives. A little island no larger than the state of Idaho. Half a million people live in Idaho. 96. Wow, that just goes to show what I was saying there, you know. Great Britain, roughly the size of Idaho. Wow, it's only one state. And by the looks of it, it's not a very big state in America. Six times that many live in Britain. The Natchez and the Japs scream about Lebensraum, living space. But there are more people on a square mile of Britain than a square mile of Germany or Italy or Japan. More congestion than practically any place on earth except the New York subway or a sardine can. And that's a clue that explains a lot about John Britton. We build front porches on our houses because we didn't want to miss the chance to see our neighbors. 
But John Britton hides himself in a little box and plants a hedge around that to make sure he doesn't. Living that close to neighbors, privacy is part of the pursuit of happiness. To be honest, that touches back into the, there's an old saying, you know, like every Englishman's home is his castle. Because obviously it is quite densely populated, so you might only have a small plot of land. So it's the kind of rom romanticism, if you will, of, you know, I might only have this, but it's mine. So there, it's just a simple house. Actually quite a nice house when you look at it. But you get a bush around it and that might as well be your own island behind that bush. That's kind of like the, the psychology of uh, behind every man's castle. Is, sorry, every man's house is his castle. And in the sardine can called Britain, they learn to get on with their neighbors. They have to. He's too damn close. That's why they have so little crime in Britain. Believe it or not, even in wartime, the British cop does not carry a gun. And that's true, straight through till modern times today. I wouldn't say crimes are, are low in, in Great Britain. Uh, I think it, maybe it was back then, because I still hear tales of people saying, you know, used to be to go out and leave your front door open, like my grandparents and things like that, post-war, but I think times have changed quite a lot in the last 50 years, 60 years or so. Nor does the professional crook. And in 1926, when the world heard of this stoppage of work in Britain, that industry, transportation, the whole life of the country had been paralyzed by a general strike, it was still more surprised next day to learn that the strikers were playing football with the cops. You can only understand that if you live in a sardine can. We've already seen rugby um, at the start of this, and obviously America has baseball as its pastime, but in the UK and England, football, and I don't want to get into a dispute with you, my American friends, but we call it football because we have a ball and we have feet and we kick the ball. There you go, football. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that for us is our pastime. It's like, it's easily the number one sport in, in Great Britain, in Europe, well, probably the world actually for that matter. But, yeah. The second clue to this guy on our team. No part of Britain is more than a hundred miles from the sea. Every day for hundreds of years, years of peace and years of war, John Britton has seen ships sail from his island to the seven seas. That means that whenever John Britton wants to bust out of his sardine can, it's the sea that gets him. He's been busting out for hundreds of years, and that led to Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, and for that matter, the United States of America. Again, you know, some really major nations there, and I wouldn't say they've got Britain to be thankful for. I guess it's the, well, in a way, I suppose, but it was more to do with the dominance of the sea. You know, as you just said there, to escape the sardine can, we had to build ships. Um, and because we built so many ships, we become masters at it and became masters of the sea. Hence, what led to the, the British Empire ruling the waves type of thing. So, yeah. Um, fascinating like again such a small nation and um, had such a big impact on the global stage how did john britain get on our team remember 1938 the yankees won the pennant wrong way corrigan the last trains ran on the sixth avenue l well john britain got excited about the same sort of things the bet he had on the derby or, as he would say, the Derby. His job. His kids. Getting his exercise on his day off. Preston North End taking the football cup. Only 300 miles away, people were cheering another kind of event. So I just want to pause that just so I can take that image in. So obviously, people have talked about the SWAT sticker. It was a, 
it was a symbol of peace in Hinduism, I believe. It's like a Sanskrit symbol, like really, really ancient. And it's interesting how we used the Nazis used the symbol as you know, I'm not too familiar what, what the Nazi sim version of the symbol means. Maybe it's something I'll have to look into that. But just look at the way the rows of like, walking down the centre of the room and everybody's up saluting. I mean they are they are fully engaged right there, aren't they? Whether they were all told to, to behave this way before Hitler entered the room, who knows, but sent the room like you know, a bit like Donald Trump really, you know, like people are like really rallying behind him, seemingly. <laughs> And in London and every other British city and town, they read about what was going on in Europe, and they got sore about it. But they were also pretty well determined to keep it none of their business. Then, this looked bad. The Czechs had a mutual assistance pact with France. And France had one with Britain. This might mean war. Sorry, boy. You know, when you're looking through the lens of modern times to, to this, you know, that's, this is just a good example of it, how the media back then, it was very limited broadcast, you know, radio, TV. So a lot of the information was passed out via print and press, i.e. newspapers, etc. Now, the propaganda that could have been pumped, produced and sent out back then is a... Uh, you know, there was, when you got that information out the newspaper, there was no way to double check the, the legitimacy of the information. So I wonder how much of this was hysterics back then. You know, obviously we all know through the lens of, of history and stuff and hindsight that well, there was a war, there, a lot of people died and it's a lot of destruction. But, you know, we always know, one thing that we do know is that history writes the, the victor writes history. So who knows? I mean, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist here, you know, like, war is war, but it's just interesting to see, like, how influential the newspapers were and things like that. Even though everyone was anxious to avoid it. They'd been through one war, perhaps been wounded. Hundreds of thousands of their brothers and friends had been killed. There was nothing beautiful to them about war, and they had no desire for another. desperate effort to preserve peace, the Prime Minister today flew to Munich. All was well. Britain, France, Italy and Germany were signing a pact at Munich. A pact in which the Germans agreed they had no further territorial claims to make. It was to be peace in our time. But it turned out to be a strange sort of peace. Hitler's first move was to break the pact he had signed. Wishful thinking was ended. Now they knew something had to be done about Germany. See, in that instance there, it's like, surely the intelligence apparatus would have known the legitimacy of the peace arrangement. So, you had the media pumping the, 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 the peace and the negotiations and to stave off war. But I wonder if behind the scenes, whether all parties knew that it was an inevitability that war was going to take place. They approved the Conscription Act, the first peacetime conscription in British history, just as the Selective Service Act was the first in American history. The British have put their cards on the table. They had, in effect, said to Hitler, That's enough. If you go into Poland, we'll fight. Hitler smiled. Like other would-be conquerors of Britain, Philip of Spain, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, he thought he understood the British. He didn't. The sleeping lion began to wake up. He was a pretty drowsy lion for the first six months of the war. He snapped and growled. But he dropped 
more leaflets than bombs. See the leaflets, it's almost like a propaganda campaign, you know. There's a, as I mentioned in my last video, obviously I spent time in the forces, and one of the things that is vitally important when you go in, engage in a conflict, is to win the heart and mind. Now, obviously, I don't know, these leaflets getting dropped, uh, it's obviously not to try and win the heart and mind, but it's the beginning of psychological warfare, you know, which obviously is a major part in any conflict. Uh, but yeah, fascinating. He hoped that common sense would return to the German people and that they would throw out Hitler and the German warlords. Instead... At dawn this morning, the German armies, without warning, invaded the neutral countries of Luxembourg, Holland and Belgium. The King of the Belgians today surrendered his armies of more than half a million men. Petain, as French chief of state, has asked for an armistice. The issue in France is ended. Britain was alone. France asking for armistice. Well, we're not surprised there, are we? To be honest. Czechoslovakia occupied. Poland defeated. Denmark gone. Norway gone. Holland, Belgium, France gone. Only Britain now. Britain was alone. Hitler considered the war over. Everybody considered the war over, except the British. At the 11th hour, the lion was finally aroused. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on be- Sorry, I'll take this back just a touch. This is that famous uh, Winston Churchill speech right here. War over. Everybody considered the war over, except the British. At the 11th hour, the lion was finally aroused. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. For a year, they took everything that the Nazis could throw at them. For one solid year, from June 1940 to June of 1941, they were the only major power fighting the greatest war machine in the world. Yeah, obviously, I had two, two grandfathers who fought in the Second World War. Um, but I remember hearing a story about from uh, my grandfather. Uh, sorry, I had great grandfathers and grandfathers there, but one of my grandfathers was telling me when he was a young boy, um, this is in Liverpool, in England, that uh, there was uh, the sirens went off and they had to get out of bed in the middle of the night, make their way to the local air raid shelter. And as he was on his way, a uh, bomb dropped and took out a house where one of his good friends lived. And um, yeah, that was the end of the family, pretty much, you know. And it it must have been terrifying times back then, you know. I mean, to be in the conflict itself, you know, you you're prepared for it, you're being trained for it, you're in the state of mind for to accept anything, any eventuality, any potentiality. But the flip side, you know, civilians, you're lying in bed in the middle of the night, the next minute. Alarms are ringing, sirens going off, bombs start dropping. Now that must have been absolutely terrifying, you know, mothers grabbing babies out the, out the cot to run to an air raid shelter and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, sometimes it's often lost on, on the mind, the, the civilian casualties in, in a war. But you see, this is more of that heart and mind. Um, psychological warfare again. They're trying to break the spirit of the British people with the bombing of civilian populace, just like the British were dropping leaflets and later went on to, to do bombings on German civilians. You know, the war got pretty nasty all around, really. But <laughs> yeah, go on. They took 
body blow after body blow. Solid punches before they even had their guard up. All they did was take it on the chin and hang on to the ropes. They never went down. And while they buried their dead, they prepared grimly and defiantly for the day when they could strike back. There were no victories to cheer them on, just defeat after defeat. Some heroic, like the beaches of Dunkirk, or like the hills of Greece, where British soldiers landed to keep their pledge of honor to the Greek people. Excuse me, that's another thing that's often lost on the, the Second World War, just how big the theater, the combat theater was. You know, they had, uh, they had Af from, from Africa, up north into Europe, across Eurasia, um, into Asia, you know, obviously the Japanese became involved by bombing bombings on Pearl Harbor, which is the west coast of America. So you're talking like the only area that didn't see significant combat well, it was probably Antarctica maybe. <laughs> um but saying that though, you know, if it, everyone's heard of the the tales of Admiral Baird going down to New Schwabia and things like that, but that's maybe a video for another day. Landed knowing they were facing overwhelming odds. But some less glorious. Hong Kong and Singapore. Burma. But through all these long months, the British people were thinking and planning and working only for the day when they themselves could take the offensive. And that day came. British aircraft at the time had, uh, I believe it was Rolls-Royce engines, which were like well-built, incredible engines, which I'm pretty sure there's still like a lineage till modern day of, even though uh, Rolls-Royce is a car manufacturer, I'm pretty sure Rolls-Royce still produce engines for commercial aircraft, you know, like 747s, things like that. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Oh, there was a lot of civilian casualties in these bombings as well. You say one of the saddest things about all these bombings that took place right across Europe was the the architecture, some of the the cultural heritage that had been around for some buildings for millennia you know there were some really really ancient beautiful pieces of architecture that are remnants from like cultures gone by and they were just wiped out buildings whole whole sections ancient monuments everything just wiped out it's crazy <laughs> Of continues in greater and greater strength. That's in the air. And on the ground, 1,500 miles away in North Africa.
was a turning point, if I'm not mistaken. And the British used like rubber tanks and inflatable tanks and inflatable guns and things like that, artillery. So when the Germans were flying reconnaissance flights over over North Africa, they thought the British were aligned up to attack in a certain direction. When in actual fact, obviously they were all fake pieces of equipment and Montgomery managed to spring a surprise on Rommel. Me, history is not 100% but I'm pretty sure that was around the Battle of El Alamein. Like, it rings a bell. in 122 days, 1,700 miles of sand and wind and enemies. Once more, the people of Britain heard their church bells ring. More than three years earlier, they had been warned that this would be the signal of invasion. But long since the nightmare of the threat of invasion had passed, now the bells rang out a song of thanksgiving, a song of victory. Sorry, just a um, little bit of history for people. Just before the Second World War kicked off, there was actually a cathedral due to be built in Liverpool and um, obviously the city itself is famous for having two cathedrals we've got what we call the wigwam and obviously the Anglican we've got a Catholic and a Protestant cathedral now one of them's made of sandstone which is one of the largest sandstone buildings in the world I believe and another one it looks like a looks like a giant crown now the one that looks like a giant crown, I actually went there recently um, before the lockdowns came in and was taking a few photographs and stuff and I went inside to have, a, to have a little look and read some of the history. Actually there was a model of the building, how it was going to originally look. And excuse me, it would have looked a lot, excuse me, it would have looked a lot like St Paul's Cathedral, only it would have been bigger and far more grand. Like. It would have been would have been incredible. It would have been like a Vatican City level of building. You know, it, it was incredible. Obviously, it wasn't to be because the war started. Funds were redirected and and all the rest of it. But yeah, a little bit of history there. <laughs> the plain and simple truth about Britain. But the fellow that calls the signals on the Axis team knows his only chance of winning is to split our team up. So his team plays a game at which they've had a lot of practice. A game which has conquered half a dozen countries for them. A game called Divide and Conquer. Men like these tell the British we aren't taking the war seriously. Divide and Conquer. You know, look at the the polarizing society we live in today. Everything's left versus right, isn't it? They tell the Russians we are letting them down. They tell the British the Russians will sell them out. And they tell us... It is manifestly ridiculous for the warmonger Roosevelt to tell the American people that they have anything in common with the British. On the contrary, 
They are different in every respect. Well, there are differences. <laughs> I didn't realise they put broadcasts like that old, trying to, as he says, divide and conquer between Britain and America. Because um, any Americans who watch this, any British people who watch this, they'll they'll know we are we are very similar, you know. Um, in fact, we're so similar. I, I can't think of specifics. You know, you'd have to probably think of specifics why we aren't similar, because the majority of things we we are we are still pretty attached. You know, I think our love of freedom is probably um, up there at the top. That's true. For instance, we drive on the right side of the road, but in Britain, we go for baseball. They have a little number called cricket. Cricket's a popular sport, but it's not our pastime, no way. Very well played, sir. And anyone who ever drank coffee over there knows why there'll always be in England. Is your coffee all right, sir? Give us a glass of half an hour. Have you heard about it, boys? Give us another glass of half an hour. Blimey, you'd have thought it happened to poor old Bill. And another bloke here. Young... So I went in to suck my dinner. But it's that and buckets and I was getting swatch. He... Half and half, is that a... Is that like a lager lemonade shandy? He let that back. A man Tchaikovsky's smaller piano fort works are past... Are they kidding, Jack? Why the cockamamie sprickly from schmaltz mixed with celery tonic? Why do they all mush so much with corn cone in their mouth? You all can't understand a word they say. Yes, there are differences. But there are a few things that Britain and America do have in common. And these are the important things of life. A little thing called a free representative government. We call it Congress. They call it Parliament. A little thing called freedom of speech. You know, in the next war, you've not got to go to it. They'll bring the war to you. And the thing is, if you take it from me... Hey. The next war, you won't have to go to it. They'll bring the war to you. It's interesting that because, you know, there's a lot of people out there in society today feel like they are engaged in a war. It's called information wars. And obviously the advent of the internet and things like that. It's like the war has come into your living room. It's come onto your smartphone, your smart TV. You know, the guy's well ahead of his time. Hey, go on them at the Dorchester, because the trenches are just outside. This meeting is called on the office of the American Workers' Party, an organization dedicated to the organizing of the working class of America. Freedom of the press. Freedom of religion. They may not be important to Hitler, but all these things are the common heritage of John Q. Public and John Britain. 700 years ago, their ancestors fought for the Magna Carta. No one will we deny or delay right or justice. That document, and I don't know, again, my American friends and things will be, they're all over the American independence, you know, uh, American Constitution and is it the Bill of Rights I believe that they, that they have um, but this is the one this is the bad boy that started started a lot of dominoes falling all the way through to the 21st century it was a revolutionary moment that Magna Carta 300 years ago the petition of right no man shall be compelled to yield any tax without act of Parliament these principles came to our own country with the earliest settlers and from them developed Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. So it's like a more, once you got to the American, the American documents, it's like it became more refined, you know. Uh, I love that term, checks and balances. It was like people started to see Furthermore, where the weaknesses of the text were, so they need to put more security in the writing. 
may make gags about each other's accents, but we speak the same language of freedom. Even during the American Revolution, when we were at each other's throats, the Earl of Chatham was free to say about us to the British Parliament, You cannot but respect their cause and wish to make it your own. And that is why in the heart of London, alongside his great naval hero, Nelson, John Britton has put George Washington. And in Parliament Square, the most sacred spot in the British Commonwealth of Nations, Abraham Lincoln. Of course, Hitler doesn't like this kind of talk. His job is to sell the British that we are a nation of money grubbers. So that's just uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln statues in London. I mean, that goes to show you the connection there, you know. And I was interested to see actually that George Washington statue there. I won't scroll back just in case I go too far again, but uh, it was interesting to see that he was leaning on a fascia. Now, that fascia is, a, I believe it's a bundle of arrows or axes or something that's tied up. Uh, and it represents the right to rule. And the interesting thing about that fashion is I, I seen somebody say that it's a Roman, it's a Roman symbol for rule, and it exists all the way through till today. And what's fascinating for me with that is the fact that we still have, you know, neoclassical architecture and the use of fascias into all that. It's interesting. But uh, yeah, I'm not gonna bore you with that, but just fascinating. They are different in every respect. And gangsters. Well, in the next studio, he is selling us the idea that the British are gutless and dopes. The John Q. Public and John Britain are entirely different. All right, Hitler. Where are these miners? Wales or West Virginia? These farmers? Devonshire or Wisconsin? These steel workers, Sheffield or Pittsburgh? These children, American or British, they live in lands which share the same hopes, the same ideals, and unlike the poor children of Germany, in lands where the truth is free. Sorry, they're quick. How often do you see people, kids in, in swing parks and stuff these days? I mean, suppose on a hot day, you know, everybody wants to get down to the park, but, you know, all, all these kids would be on uh, iPads and smartphones and PlayStation 5s now. But let's not kid ourselves. Britain is not the United States, and the United States is not Britain. For instance, we don't go in for this kind of thing. They do. But there's no mystery about that. Remember our grandmother's house? It was old-fashioned, out of date, patched and altered to suit each new generation, and filled with family relics even grandmother couldn't explain. Well, John Britton has been living in his house for a long time. And that's why to us, who live in a modern house that we built ourselves to suit ourselves, John Breton seems slow-moving and cluttered up with ancient traditions. Kings, for instance. The present king rode to his coronation in the same coach, to the same church, for the same ceremony as his ancestors did. But the job he took on is very different from theirs. There have been some changes made, for the British king can no longer make laws or impose Sorry, uh, I know he's in mid-sentence. I just wanted to say that quickly. Do you see the chair, the, the throne that the king's been coronated on? Apparently that throne is a representation of the throne of David. Going back to, you know, in the Bible, the, the, the tribes of Israel and things like that. Um, fascinating. And they do actually put a tabernacle type tent over the, the monarchy before they get anointed with the holy oil as well which is fascinating and they get coronated on um, the stone of destiny which is believed to be related to Jacob of the Bible I'm not saying it's true, it's just you know. impose taxes or interfere with government he and his family work as hard as any other citizen doing the job that the people expect of them today the king is the servant of the people and not its ruler 
When an American is arrested and brought to trial, the bailiff calls his case. The people versus John Doe. But if such a case were called in Britain, it would be... The king versus John Doe. It means the same thing. Today, the British king is the symbol of the people. The British are great fans of the fellow in Buckingham Palace. But when they sing, God save the king, they're not worrying about his health. They mean, God bless the British people. And the dukes and the earls. But in 1911, the people took away the last remaining power of the lords to block the action of the people's representatives. Dukes and earls don't run the country anymore. Today, there are only two people who do that. John Britton and his wife. They go to the polls, just as Mr. and Mrs. John Q. Public do here and elect their representatives to... So, yeah, I notice he keeps referencing the American populace as John Q. Which I find interesting because obviously we've just gone through a couple of years of hearing things like Q Anon, uh, well Q Anon, Q Drops, you know, this like Q Conspiracy Theory in America, and I wonder if that's where the, the Q came from, you know, Joe Public, Joe Q, or John Q as he's saying here. The House of Commons, and there they fix the taxes and make the laws. And if John wanted to get rid of the Lords, his representatives in Commons can at any time vote them out of existence. But John doesn't want to get rid of them. So he confuses us by keeping Dukes and Lords in a country where unions have long been accepted as an essential part of the democratic system, where the Labour Party controlled by the unions is one of the two great political parties, where longshoremen and railroad engineers have been ministers of the Crown, and where for 30 years he has had a system of social security even more extensive than our own. So when you read about Lord Lewis Mountbatten or Lord Beaverbrook, former head of aircraft production, don't think they got their jobs because of their titles. They got them because they were the best men for the jobs. Just as Ernest Bevan, formerly a labor leader and now a member of the War Cabinet, Herbert Morrison, who started life as an errand boy and is now Minister of Home Security, got their important jobs because they were the best men for them. With the things on the surface, the unimportant things, their John Britton and our John Q. Public differ. But the important part of their lives, they run the same way, the democratic way, the free way. But this gentleman never bothered about the truth. And when John Britton started carrying the war to Germany, he tried a new line. The war among a Churchill only wages this war against the German people to save the British Empire. All right. Technically, I don't think he was too wrong there. Because at that time, the British kind of knew, like we kind of knew, our empire kind of knew that, you know, times were changing. No longer could you rule over people with an iron fist, if you will. You know, they're the kind of things we look at in society today as a centralization of power, taking control of everything, really. We, we see that as like, it's like communism, don't we? You know, we see that as like uh, against free enterprise and free markets, i.e. capitalism. And obviously that's a big debate that we see in in society today and um, between again the left versus the right type of thing but yeah i don't necessarily think he was too wrong there i think britain at the time they knew that the empire was, was coming to an end you know no longer could we keep affording to send so many of our young sons overseas to fight wars because the population of the country was getting decimated you know fighting overseas and, and all this because not just the two world wars that, that Great Britain fought in, we had something called the Boer Wars, which was in the century before that. And that was when we fought, I think it was the Second Boer War, we actually sent our largest ever um, force overseas. It was something like half a million troops or something like that. Now that's, that's half a million people out of your population that are going to breed and 
you know, have jobs and uh, and all this kind of stuff. And it, that's why it was interesting after the Second World War, Great Britain actually had a, a programme, if you will, where we were trying to settle as many people as we could into our country, you know, through the, through the Commonwealth, from like places like India and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's fascinating. So I don't think he was too wrong when uh, he says Britain are trying to save their empire. Uh, I think after the First World War and definitely during and after the Second World War, the writing was on the wall. Let's take a look at that one. Here's the British Empire. And here's where the Germans were headed when Britain declared war. Does that look like trying to save the empire? Tackling Germany when it was headed into Poland and toward Russia? The one direction in which there were no British possessions? After Poland fell... That's fascinating actually, I never thought about it in that context. Um, interesting. I always remember hearing someone say, and I don't know if this is true or not, I don't want to put any attachment to it really, but the person said that if Hitler would have went after, say, um, a Muslim populace instead of the Jewish populace, at the time there was other nations in the area who were a bit worried about like the Muslim presence. Now, I'm not trying to crap on Muslims here, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm, believe what you want to believe, believe who you want to believe, I'm freedom of speech and all that, freedom of expression. But it's interesting there because that, that, that visual is so striking isn't it they, they they are going away from great britain they're going away from america but at the same time you know there's already multiple conflicts taking place now and obviously great britain was quite close with poland they have a uh, historical links with poland so when uh, hitler went into poland obviously that was a um, that was it then pretty much it it was like there was really no going back after that but yeah that's an interesting visual that it really is. Hitler hinted at peace with the British. This was the perfect chance to save the empire. But it wasn't saving the empire that the British were thinking about. The position of His Majesty's government in respect of any peace offer by Hitler. We are not in any circumstances prepared to negotiate with him at any time, on any subject. And after Britain had been on the losing end, month after month, it had another chance to save the empire. Even now, Hitler thought John Britain would make a deal. We heard that... Yeah, he actually... He escaped Germany, didn't he? And, um stole a plane and apparently flew into Great Britain and jumped out of his plane, parachuted down or crash landed or something like that. I believe it was in like Scotland and it was his intent to come over and broker a deal between Great Britain and Germany and to the best of my recollection I'm pretty sure he just got through in jail um, and that was it until a, believe the Nuremberg trials when he was convicted. The British answer. What kind of a people do they think we are? Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? And let's take a look at this British Empire. The freedom we fought for in 1776, Britain... Sorry, just, just look at that image there. If you look in the South Atlantic, well, keep going north, obviously all in territories in Africa and, and the Mediterranean. But then you've got all these Caribbean islands, you know, uh, Bahamas and, and all that. And then you come across into the Pacific, and again, all of the island chains are pretty much occupied by, by Great Britain at this point. Which just harps on to what I was saying earlier on, you know, about the power of our navy and stuff. And like the guy said, you know, when you want to escape a, a tin of sardines. <laughs> well, we escaped and we found many other tins by the look of it. ...has since freely given to Canada... ...a 
Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. These are independent nations with their own parliaments, their own laws, even their own money systems, their own tariffs, which often work to Britain's disadvantage, their own armies and navies. Britain couldn't even take them into war if she wanted to. That's a problem they settled for themselves. Each one of the British Commonwealth of Nations declared war on Germany of its own free will. Of course, no one ever talks about the British Empire today without mentioning India. And men of goodwill in Britain as well as other countries have been outspoken in their demands for Indian freedom. I just say very quickly as well. You know, this was saying about like uh, the repopulation after the Second World War and stuff. A lot of Hindus and Sikhs and stuff were given asylum and citizenship in, in Great Britain. And I've known like Hindu people and stuff growing up me. And you know they are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet ever. Always smiling, always positive. Um, but it goes to show you that, you know, like the, the relationship between Great Britain and India, even through till modern times today, you know, it's a, it's a very close relationship and it's one of friendship now. Um, obviously, there was the imperial side of things when Britain was an empire and occupied India and things like that. But India at the time was also a, a large mass, large nation that was in a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of, um, imbalance in the society if you will and i'm not saying it was it was necessarily a good thing that britain invaded and occupied but come when britain came out of there you know the structure that was in place in india um but you look at them now though the emerging economy like the, probably the biggest emerging economy and they've got to sit over a billion people they're sending satellites allegedly into space and on the moon and all this kind of stuff so you know, out of that deal, out of that entanglement, if you will, you know, what's happened since then is um, it's it's pretty much proof, really, that these two have remained really, really close friends and allies. For no man who believes in democracy can support foreign rule of any people. But there are things that many of us do not know about India. For instance, that India pays no taxes to Britain either directly or indirectly. That the Indians fix their own tariff laws, frequently to Britain's disadvantage. That of the Viceroy's Executive Council, 11 of the 15 members are Indians. And in the courts, 10 of every 11 judges. Furthermore, that no Indian is ever conscripted for service in the Army and Navy. It was voluntary enlistment that raised the Indian Army from 170,000 at the outbreak of war to a million and a quarter today. And on the subject of India, listen to the words of Field Marshal Jan Christian Smuts. He fought against the British 40 years ago, was defeated in his fight, and still became the leader of one of the British Commonwealths of Nations. Wow, he actually looks younger since he retired than he did in uniform there. Unless that was like a, I don't know, like an, a, a reunion photograph. Prime Minister of South Africa. India, if she will, can be free in the same way and by the same means as Canada, Australia, New Zealand are today free sovereign states. Their peoples worked out a constitution for themselves. The same course is open to India if the peoples of India will agree about the terms of a free constitution. Freedom isn't a thing that can be imposed from without. It can only be created from within. The Indians have a responsibility to reconcile the differences that exist in the vast Indian population with its hundred different languages, its dozens of different religions. And on March the 11th, 1942, the British government placed itself on record and promised full self-government to India if India will work out a constitution that will satisfy its people after the war is over. But during this war, military leaders agree allied troops are needed in India as an effective block by the democratic world to keep the Nazis and Japs from uniting. Further, India provides the bases for United Nations bombers to get at the Japs in Burma. 
In other parts of the empire, too, democracy stands on guard. If it wasn't for the British at Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, Suez, Alexandria. Interestingly, I've been to Gibraltar, Malta and Cyprus, but I'd love to get over here to the Middle East. Really love to visit Israel. And they're hanging on to them regardless of the cost. And their drive across Libya to Tripoli, there would have been no American landing in North Africa. There's another tune the Nazis play about the British Empire. The British are sitting back, letting others fight the war for them. Ooh, we know that tune very well. Britain will fight to the last Australian or Canadian or New Zealander. The truth that thousands of Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders have gallantly fought and gallantly died in Crete, in Greece, in Libya. But there's something the Nazi mouthpiece leaves out, something pretty important. Out of every ten inhabitants of the British Empire, one comes from Britain. But of the casualties suffered so far in this war, seven out of ten were born and raised in Britain. One of ten... Wow, so one in ten of the Empire's population is British, but seven in ten of the conflict that died was born in Britain. So that, that, that touches back to what I was saying before, you know, post Second World War, there was, there was a bit of a vacuum in, in, in England, in, in Britain. Um, because obviously so many of the young men had passed away. And in population, seven of ten in casualties. And in the air, of the planes flying with the RAF in Britain, two out of three are manned by crews from the island. And of the planes on the overseas fronts, the western desert in Africa and the rest, four out of five are manned by boys from Britain. And then there's a little thing called the British Navy. From 1588, when it licked the Spanish Armada, to 1940, when we got moving on a two-ocean navy, the greatest battle fleet in the world, that too is manned almost entirely by men of Britain, the little island in the Atlantic, an island of seafarers. And the British Merchant Navy, still the greatest merchant navy in the world, in spite of all that Hitler can do. Men from every British town and village in the stokeholds of 10,000 ships, on ice-coated decks, in grimy engine rooms, men who have been torpedoed twice, three times. You know, that must have been really terrifying, that. You know, I've already described about, like, my granddad witnessing a, a house getting blown up with his friend in it when he was a, a child and stuff but you know being on a I, I, this is just a personal thing i have had a bit of a, not a phobia of the sea i've got a healthy respect for the power of the sea um, but to be on a, a vessel a boat getting struck by a torpedo and then just having to plunge into yourself into the ocean I mean, for me, that's, that's about as scary as it gets. There's one English sailor who's been torpedoed six times and still signed on again. But we never hear about these things because of a curious character whose ways will never be completely understandable to an American. John Britton himself. He has an idea he shouldn't talk about himself and what he does. He calls it bad form. We call it damn silly. He'd say of a Spitfire, Oh, she's not bad, little kite. But this man, the boss of the German Air Force, can tell us that the Spitfire has been the most deadly fighter in the world. And we certainly need an interpreter when this happens. Hello, Bob. Had a good trip? Oh, all right. All right. Except that he spent two days in the icy waters of the North Atlantic after... Sorry, that's just a, uh, that's British modest, modesty that, you know, Spitfire, is she a good machine? Ah, she's an alright little kite. And then you've got the Germans saying greatest war machine that 
of the, the Second World War. And here, guys being out in the frozen oceans, the frozen seas. And how was your trip? Oh, it was, was alright. <laughs> you know. And I think that I think that's a bit more of the modesty of the time as well. <coughs> Excuse me. I think we could do with uh, maybe trying to get back to a little bit of that. You know, everything's so dramatic and and stuff these days where the people back then, you know, he didn't even stop and engage the conversation. He's, he knows where he's going. He's going home probably to his wife and kids. He's had a tough few months away and he's just like, yeah, it was all right. Time to go home. Hope the kettle's on. Being torpedoed on the way to Murmansk. See this man? His name is Whitten Brown. And this man, believe it or not, is the first man who flew the Atlantic nonstop. In 1919, eight years before anyone else, he and John Alcock flew non-stop from Newfoundland to Ireland. But as usual, the British let it go at that, and Whitten Brown went back into obscurity. There's nothing wrong with John Britton that a correspondence course in showmanship wouldn't cure. For a moment, imagine that you're not American, but British. You'd still be in uniform, for in Britain, every man between the age of 18 and 41, unless he cannot be replaced at a vital workbench, is already in uniform. Your old man, too. He's had to quit gassing about the last war, for they're now starting to draft men up to 51. Dependence or no dependence. If you've got yourself into this mess, your draft board will say, frightfully sorry, old chap, but you're in the army anyway. And your kid sister, if she isn't a sailor, or in the Air Force, or the land army, or a ferry pilot, or in the fire brigade, she's probably in the army. So that goes to show you right there, you know, I understand that, you know, like the, the rights for women and things like that wasn't as, as strong and as, as popular uh, going back to the 40s, etc. But, you know, it also show you that women played a big role, you know. Uh, there's a lot need of like the women who, uh, who got sent to like the factories and things like that. But obviously, I mean, that just showed you women in, excuse me, in all branches of the military there. Um, I mean, here's a load of women here on a, on a piece of artillery. Looks like they're putting in the coordinates about to start firing. So, you know, uh, women are definitely capable of, uh, of helping out. Maybe not at the, the top end, like special forces due to bone density, um, structure and cohesion between males and females, etc. But uh, that's, a, that's a good example there of even back in the 40s, you know, women were valued uh, in Great Britain and they, they were a big part of the, the war effort. Well, they drafted unmarried women up to 30. And even if she's married, every woman up to 41 can be drafted to work in war plants. And it's a real draft for 8 million workers, men and women, can't quit their jobs or be fired without government permission. Britain is only 20 miles from German guns and German planes. Everybody, man or woman, young or old, is in the front line. Maybe this isn't your idea of Britain. The ads were different, and you wondered whether they still made bows and arrows at the village forge. The ads kept quiet about industry, just as this one leaves out the aircraft plants and the oil fields. Well, they have the rich green fields you've read about, the quiet country lanes, but they also have the steel mills of Sheffield, the Pittsburgh of Britain. They have the picturesque little villages, the gently flowing streams, the lovely old castles. But they also have the shipyards of the River Clyde, not as modern as Henry Kaiser's, but still one of the greatest in the world.
they have the old cathedrals, deathless reminders of a rich tradition. I'd say that's probably York Cathedral or Salisbury Cathedral. But they also have the great industrial cities of Birmingham, Glasgow, Manchester, Leeds. They seldom, if ever, saw an American tourist, but they made Britain, even in peacetime, one of the greatest industrial powers in the world. And in wartime, even as late as July 1942, this little island, no larger than the state of Idaho, was making more war goods than we were. Maybe you thought John Britton sat there and waited for us to send him planes and guns and tanks. Well, he's deeply grateful for what our Lend-Lease did for him. It saved his skin when he was in a tough spot. But today, Lend-Lease works in more ways than one. For today, John Britton himself furnishes planes and guns and tanks through the same Lend-Lease to us, to Russia, and his other allies all over the world. And to be honest, I, think, I do think uh, at this moment in time, uh, Britain is one of the biggest suppliers of uh, weapons, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, not necessarily arms and munitions, but it's more so the the technology that goes into the weapons. The uh, BAE Systems, that's the, the big, big company, like that's uh, it's got its fingers in a lot of pies at the moment. Like the new the new British jet fighter, the new Tempest, which is like 6th gen um, smart technology warplanes and stuff like that. In Britain alone, our forces have received free from the British a million and a half tons of food, clothing and munitions and two and a half million tons of other materials. There's another thing you want to know about Britain. If your unit gets sent there, you probably won't be invited out for supper or for a drink. That's not because the British don't want to entertain you. They haven't anything to entertain you with. Britain is mobilized for war, total war. And that means an end to civilian supplies. If you were a Britisher, you wouldn't expect your girl to use lipstick. There isn't any, except what we bring over as bait. She wouldn't be smartly dressed for clothes are rationed, severely rationed. It's very unlikely she wears stockings. For if she bought a pair of stockings a month, that would be all the clothes of any kind she could buy. That's some rationing. We think our gas rationing is tough, but John Britton gets no gas at all. Yeah, I remember my grandmother telling me about the rations and things like that back in the day. And it really was that scarce. Um, you know, one potato between two people for a meal things like that. I mean, at one point it got, it got really, really, really bad. He goes to a pub to buy a bottle of whiskey. The pub keeper laughs in his face. Grain is needed for industrial alcohol. Industrial alcohol is needed for munitions. And nearly all the reserve stock of British whiskey is kept for sale to America to pay for the goods Britain buys here. For don't forget, Besides Lend-Lease, Britain buys and pays for vast quantities of goods. And it was the cash purchases that Britain made before we entered the war that gave our munitions industry its start and enabled us to build it up in record time. He goes to buy a pack of cigarettes. There probably aren't any. But if there are... Two shillings, please. That's 40 cents for a pack of cigarettes. 12 cents represent the cost of the cigarettes. The other 28, the tax paid to the government. For Britain is going all out in taxation. Nobody is making any money out of this war. In That's it, you know, once again, it's just, when it comes to war, especially industrialized war, you know, the real, the real losers are just the average, average working man and woman, you know, the, the average people in society, you know, and did the war really need to take place, you know? Industry is paying. Excess profits tax is 100%. Labor is paying. The man who earns $33 a week pays 29% income tax. And the rich man, if there are any of them left, 
pays an income tax of no less than 97 and a half percent. And then there's the little matter of food. There are not many fat men in England nowadays, but John Britton isn't kicking. He knows one egg a week is helping him to win the war. The British rations are the rations of a free people. They could get food as they did in peacetime from... One egg a week? Canada, Australia, but that would take ships. And the British prefer to use the ships for supplies to Russia, planes from America, troops to the Mediterranean. To win the war, every Britisher is on short rations and has been on short rations for two years. Everybody except the children. They get four times the eggs that grown-ups do. They get all the oranges that arrive in Britain and practically all of the extra milk. For John Britton is thinking of after the war, of the new world that his children and ours will inherit. A world where there will not only be freedom of speech and freedom of worship, but also freedom from want and freedom from fear. It is not given to us to peer into the mysteries of the future. Still I avow my hope and faith, sure and inviolate, that in the days to come, the British and American peoples will for their own safety and for the good of all, walk together in majesty, in justice, and in peace. This is what the British are fighting for. They are an old people, a stubborn people, and sometimes they have moved slowly. But in three years of blood and sweat and tears, John Britton has found his soul. Now he is tough. Now he is determined and now he knows where he is marching, to victory and to a new world. He's a good man to have on our team. Does anybody else want an apple after that crunch then? <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting, that. Uh, know your ally, Britain. I thought it was going to be a bit different than that. I thought it was going to be a bit more in-depth about the actual allies of Great Britain. Like, during the... Uh, first and maybe second world wars but it was more about the the impact of of britain to all the other allies really wasn't it it was uh, more about what britain was able to produce and and achieve during that second world war and um, i have to say i thought that was quite interesting uh, i like to, to watch some of these older documentaries and stuff but yeah i hope you enjoyed it guys and um, Please leave a like and subscribe and hopefully I might see you in another video. Peace.